We're ready to go. Okay. Excellent. Uh, well, thanks for having me, uh, everyone. I'm, uh, I'm Dr. Steve Case. I teach astronomy at Olivet Nazarene University, and I'm also the planetarium director here. And uh, you guys can't come to the planetarium. I'm sorry about that. Uh, so instead, we're going to bring the planetarium to you. And I'm going to be talking to you guys a little bit today about our place in the universe, about stars and the sun. Um, and then I think Mr. Gardner can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think at the end we'll have maybe some uh, question and answer time uh, if you guys have questions. But I wanted to start by just telling you a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up going to a planetarium as a kid in my hometown of Flint, Michigan, and loved it. Loved the idea of being able to show people space, show people the stars, look at the sky uh, anytime, day or night. And so that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to get into that. So I went uh, to school, actually here at Olivet, to learn how to run the planetarium. And then went and did my master's and my PhD. And now I'm back here teaching and um, doing what I always wanted to do. Um, I want to, I think I can do this. If I show you guys, if I pull this picture onto the screen, do you guys see that? Do you guys see that picture of the planetarium? I wanted to show you a photo of the outside of the planetarium so you get a sense of what this building actually looks like. So this is actually more like a virtual field trip. So I've, I just want to make sure it's visible. Um, you guys can see the swirling galaxies, right? We've got that screensaver going. Um, but can you also see a picture of the planetarium? No. No, okay. No. Let me fix no. that. Maybe I can do this. I don't see anything. I just see the sun. Can you see that? See it. See it. See now. See that. Yeah. Okay. Now you can see that. Now we see it. So that's a uh, that's a picture of um, what the outside of this building looks like. That is my planetarium, the Strickler Planetarium. <clears throat> and you guys can see it's kind of goofy looking. It's kind of got a dome shaped roof, and um, and it's because it's a really special building. It's a place specifically meant for people to come inside and be able to take a look at uh, the night sky. So I'm actually going to show you guys what this building looks like from the inside now. And I'm just going to do this by using my, um, my video camera. If I move my camera, I can't see myself. So you'll have to tell me if this is working. OK, so can you guys see the inside of the planetarium here? We've got the seats where you guys would all come in and you sit in the seats. And then we've got this big sort of thing at the center that looks like Darth Vader's refrigerator. That's, uh, that's our projectors. And then if you were sitting here above your head, you just see this big dome stretching above your head. And that is where everything that we're looking at in the planetarium would actually be projected. Yeah, I've been there. So that's sort of a, just a really short little tour of what the planetarium looks like from the inside. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and pull the planetarium screen back up so we can actually look at uh, the night sky. All right. Okay. So, is everybody looking at, oh, we've still got all the galaxies on. We don't, we can't actually see those galaxies with our naked eyes. So let's get those galaxies turned off. And let's actually turn everything off. Here we go. So you guys should be looking at a big blank circle. Is that what you guys see on your screen right now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, here we go. So let's, uh, let's actually bring the, the sky up. So this, I want you to imagine this big circle as the sky, right? So if you were here in the planetarium, you would be able to, this would be the dome that would be above your head. So you'd be looking up at this dome. So you could do this a couple different ways. You could just imagine that you were lying on your back and that this circle was the sky above your head. Um, you probably shouldn't, uh, but if you really wanted to, I guess you could like hold your Chromebook up over your head like this was on the ceiling, but don't, don't do that, that's a bad idea. Um, so this is the night, this is the sky, this is the daytime sky. So right now I've got the sky set for the daytime sky. And um, I guess I should have tested this as well. Can you guys see my cursor? Can you see a mouse moving around on that screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So we've got a dot down here, low yes. horizon. Anybody know what that is? Looks really small. 
It's the Milky Way. Oh yeah, well that's what the pop-up said, wasn't it? So we've got the sun. So this is the daytime sky. We're looking at the sun. Um, and since it's almost winter, the sun is really low in our sky. This is in the southern sky. I'm gonna turn on some directions just so we can find our way around here. So you've got this N sort of way up at the top of the screen. Uh, we've got east over to your left and west over to your right. And the sun is down in the south. And if we move time forward, we're actually gonna see the sun is gonna continue to move westward. We're gonna get a nice simulated sunset. And then we're gonna see the stars come out. So this is what's really fun in the planetarium because imagine this over your head. You can see all of the stars um, and, uh, and on, on like the darkest, clearest night you can imagine. And so someone mentioned the Milky Way. You can see the Milky Way stretching across the sky this time of year. So if you're in a really, really dark spot, you could actually see the Milky Way. And we'll talk about what the Milky Way is in just a second. Um, but what I want to do is I actually want to move time backward because I want to show you guys just a couple things right as the sun is starting to set tonight. So before it gets too dark, the sun goes down in the west. You can spot with your naked eye three really cool objects in the sky this time of year. So if you look down in the southern sky, you've got these two dots that are really close together. You can actually spot two planets in the sky this time of year. So we've got, I'm gonna put these labels up here. We've got Jupiter and we've got Saturn. And they are right next to each other in the southern sky. So if you go out tonight and it's clear and you look in the southern sky right after sunset, you've got these two planets right next to each other. Keep your eye on these planets because they're actually getting closer and closer together. And by the beginning of winter, they're gonna be almost right on top of each other. They're gonna be heading toward a conjunction. And if you look further over in the east, you've got another bright object rising in the eastern sky, and this is the planet Mars. So even if you don't have a telescope, just with your naked eye, if you go outside tonight, and actually for the next several weeks, and you look in the southern sky, you can find Jupiter and Saturn, and you look in the eastern sky, you can spot Mars. You've got three planets you can see in the sky, <clears throat> pardon, this time of year. Um, okay, so let's move time back. Let's get going to a deeper, darker night sky. And let's just look briefly at some of the things we can uh, see in the sky tonight. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna show you guys a couple of constellations and talk a little bit about what constellations are. But then what I really wanna focus on today is stars and the sun and talking about the star as a sun. And I actually wanna take you into space to look at a couple stars. Um, but to get our bearings, I do wanna talk a little bit about constellations. So I am going to show you guys a group of three bright stars, and I'm gonna draw a triangle in the sky. You guys see, uh, I'm tracing out this group of three bright stars. And this is actually a group of stars that we call, this triangle of stars, we call the summer triangle because we can see it pretty easily in the summer sky. But even now that we're getting toward winter into autumn, um, it's still visible in the west after sunset. And the Summer Triangle is actually made up of three different constellations. We have a co little tiny constellation called Lyra the Harp, another one called Aquila the Eagle, and another one called Cygnus the Swan. And I'm actually gonna zoom in on these. Now there's, there's not gonna be a test. You guys don't have to memorize these constellations. Um, but I wanna use them because we can talk about what constellations are. Oops, and I just pulled the sun up. So let me fix that. I'll fix that by draining away the atmosphere. And I want to zoom in a little bit on this group of three constellations. So this group of constellations in the Summer Triangle. And we can think about constellations in a couple different ways. <clears throat> you can think about constellations kind of like connect the dots picture with the stars. So for instance, um, You've got Lyra the Harp, Aquila the Eagle, and Cygnus the Swan. I'll put those labels up there so you can see them. And you could imagine also <clears throat> um, constellations as sort of imagining what the picture looks like. So maybe if you had a really good imagination, you could maybe look at Lyra the Harp and see something that looks sort of like a harp. Or maybe you could look at Cygnus the Swan and see something that kind of actually did look like a swan flying down the Milky Way. 
And maybe you could look at Aquila the Eagle and see something that looks sort of like an eagle carrying someone through the sky. And so those are classically how constellations were known as sort of mythological pictures in the sky. And if you've ever read the Percy Jackson books, you know a lot about this mythology and you probably know more constellations than you even realize. But the way that astronomers use constellations today is we use constellations as uh, kind of like zip codes. So there's actually not just these three constellations, there's actually 88 constellations in the night sky. And the way astronomers use them is they use them as a way to divide up the night sky into sections. So for an astronomer, Cygnus the Swan is really this section of the night sky. And so if I find a new comet or something and I say, oh, that's in the constellation Cygnus, that means where, it's, where it is uh, in the night sky. Um, all right. So that's sort of how constellations work. I'm gonna leave a couple constellations on because these are gonna be really important for finding our way back to Earth once we fly out into space. But I wanna show you one more important constellation first. And this is a constellation you guys probably know. If we look way up into the northern sky, we've got this group of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bright stars. Anybody know what group of stars that is? Scorpius. Ooh, good guess. Big Not Dipper. Scorpius. That is definitely the Big Dipper, yes. And the Big Dipper, I called it a constellation. It's actually not. It's actually part of a larger constellation called Ursa Major or the Big Bear. You can see the Big Dipper just sort of the back part of the bear. But Ursa Major is a really useful constellation because we use Ursa Major, the Big Dipper, and we draw a line to the North Star, the star that's in the northern sky. And I want you guys to keep your eye on this star right here, the northern star or Polaris, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to move time forward. And this is how the sky moves over the course of the night. All the stars appear to rise in the east, move across the sky, and set in the west except if you're keeping your eye on the North Star, you notice that that one star never seems to move. All the other stars seem to be going around it, but the North Star is always in the same place. And that's because the North Star is right over the Earth's North Pole. So as the Earth rotates in space, that one spot in the sky always stays in the same position. So I rotated the North, uh, I rotated the sky through, and so it's right about just before dawn now, but I wanted to bring up one more important constellation because this is where we're gonna talk about stars. So all the constellations we've been talking about are stars. Constellations are made up of stars, but I wanna show you one important constellation where we can find some really cool stars. So it's down here, way down in the southern sky, and I'm gonna turn it on here. It's at the bottom of your screen. So let me actually pull it so it's overhead. We can see it a little bit better. And this is the constellation Orion. So we're gonna use Orion because Orion is home to some really cool stars, which is gonna teach us a little bit about stars and how they change. So I'm gonna teach you two stars in Orion. And Orion, like I said, it's coming up just before dawn right now, but if you wait throughout the winter, it gets higher and higher earlier every night. So by, uh, by in a couple months, you'll be able to see Orion just as you're going to bed. And I'm going to show you two stars, the star that is in the shoulder of Orion right here and the star that is in the foot of Orion right there. So the star that's in the armpit of Orion right there in the shoulder has a really funny name. That star is called, not making it up, that is a star, Betelgeuse. Sorry, it's upside down on my screen there. If we can pull Orion down a little bit more, maybe it'll swing around. There we go. So we've got Betelgeuse the armpit of Orion. And then the star that's marking the foot is Rigel, the foot of Orion. So we've got Betelgeuse in the shoulder, we've got Rigel in the foot, <coughs> pardon me. And Orion is a, mythologically, he was a hunter. So I've been saying his foot and his shoulder. Here we can see a picture of Orion, I'll zoom in on him a little bit. 
and see what Orion would look like. And so here's Orion's belt. And just below his belt, right in the center of his sword, is the Orion Nebula. So that's going to be important as well. Because if we want to look at stars and how stars live and die, Orion is a great place to start. So everything that we've been talking about, everything that we've been looking in the sky, all these constellations, these are all made of stars. So all of this, the, the bright objects that we see in the sky, uh, all these points of light, besides the planets that I pointed out earlier, these are all stars like our sun. So that means that if we were to fly, <clears throat> if we were to fly to one of these stars, uh, what we would see is we would probably see something like our sun. So let's do that. Let's actually change our point of view and let's fly to Betelgeuse. So here we go. We're going to go from our place on the surface of the Earth. We've been looking at all the stars from the surface of the Earth. We're going to lift off from the Earth's surface and we're actually going to fly through a part of our Milky Way galaxy toward the star Betelgeuse. So here we are, we're lifting off from the Earth in our spaceship. And there we can see we're on the night side of the Earth, so we can see all the glow from all the lights. And we're going to reorient ourselves in space so we can head out toward Betelgeuse in the constellation Orion. Here we go. There goes the sun and our planets. We left our solar system behind. And we are heading through space to Betelgeuse. Now, I need to say a couple things about this trip. For one thing, it was way, way, way too fast. Betelgeuse is a couple hundred light years away. So if we were moving at the speed of light, flying to Betelgeuse, it would take us a couple hundred years to even get there. So we've gone really, really fast. The other thing that I want to do is I want to take off the labels of these planets and label the sun so we can find the sun in the sky from Betelgeuse. Let me get my controls fixed here so I can fly us around. So Betelgeuse is a star like our sun. Uh, it's a little bit different from our sun though. It is an old star, a red giant star near the end of its life. And it's incredibly large. No, sorry, hold on just a moment. I am trying to make sure that I can control our trip through the galaxy with my Xbox controller here. And it is not happy with me. Xbox controller. I fly the planetarium with an Xbox controller. That's right. All right. Navigation. Nice. Now this was working just a moment ago. Let's try this here. There we go. Well, it's not quite. We're going to try this one more time. We're going to recenter ourselves on Betelgeuse so I can control the direction we're staring. Because I want to show you what the star, what the sun looks like from Betelgeuse. So Betelgeuse is a red giant star. Like I said, it's a star that's near the end of its life. It's a star that's about to die. And from Betelgeuse, if we were actually to look back toward the sun, the sun would look like just another star. In fact, you might not even be able to see the sun in the sky from Betelgeuse if I hadn't labeled it here. So just like Betelgeuse looks like a point of light in our sky, if we were to fly to Betelgeuse from Betelgeuse, the sun would like, look like this tiny point of light. And what else do you notice? Look at the constellations I left on. All the constellations look really weird if we look at them from Betelgeuse. They don't look the same. And we're going to see why that is in just a minute. So we've got Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is an old star. Now if we were to change our view again, and let's say we were to fly to Rigel. So if we leave Betelgeuse behind and we fly to another star in Orion. Rigel is also a giant star. But Rigel's a really young star. Rigel is a young, hot, uh, blue giant star near the beginning of its life. 
And you can see it's a different color from Betelgeuse. Stars vary from each other depending on their temperature, their size, and their age. And one of the things that tells us the temperatures of stars is their color. So Rigel's a really, really hot star, so it's going to be a white blue color. Betelgeuse is a cool old star. It's going to be a yellowish or even reddish color. And again, from Rigel, our sun looks almost invisible. And even Betelgeuse is so far away that Betelgeuse looks like just a normal star again. So the distances that we're talking about here are incredibly vast. All right, so I showed you three things in Orion. I showed you Rigel, I showed you Betelgeuse in the armpit, and I showed you one other thing, the Orion Nebula. So I wanna fly you to the Orion Nebula now, because the Orion Nebula, we've looked at a young star, and we've looked at an old star in Orion. <clears throat> the Orion Nebula is a stellar nursery. It's a place where young stars are being born. And it's even farther away. So we have to go way out in our galaxy to get to this cloud of gas and dust that's known as the Orion Nebula. So a nebula is a cloud of gas and space. And at the center of a nebula, like the Orion Nebula, that gas and that dust is coming together to form baby stars. So if you find Orion in the night sky and you find the Orion Nebula, which you can see with your naked eye, you're actually seeing a place in space where some of the youngest stars in the sky are actually being born right now. So again, on this scale, Rigel and Betelgeuse and the sun now are all just distant stars. Okay, so let's do this. Uh, I want to give us plenty of time for questions and answers, but I do want to give a, talk a little bit more about our sun and our sun as a star and its place in our galaxy. So I'm going to fly us back to the sun. Good thing I left the label on so we can find our way back home. We're going to fly back to the sun and we're going to take a quick tour of our galaxy from um, the starting point of our sun as a star. So if we fly back to our sun, it's going to look kind of familiar. It's going to look a little bit like Betelgeuse looked like. Um, remember, our sun is a star, just like the other stars. Our sun is a middle-aged, really average star. Not too big, not too small, not too hot, not too cold. Um, a nice mid-range, long-lived star, which is great because, of course, we know our star, the sun, is the center of our solar system. And our solar system is made up of nine planets. Let's turn the orbits of those planets on and zoom out a little bit and get a sense of the scale of our solar system. So if I fly us out from our sun, each one of these colored circles is the orbit of one of the planets. So you guys are going to have to help me out. If we are starting at the sun and we're going outward from the sun, what's the first planet? Anybody know? Mercury. Mercury, yep, so we'll put Mercury up there. Mercury. And then what comes next? Venus. 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 All right, so we've got Venus. All right, I put Venus's label. So those are two planets pretty close to the sun. Then what's after Venus? Mars. 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 We're the third planet from the sun. You can see us there at the bottom. And then finally, the next rocky planet out from the Mars. Earth is Mars. 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 Okay, so I'm going to stop us right there for a second. <clears throat> because this group of planets, these are the inner planets. And the inner planets are all pretty similar. In fact, if we were to fly to any of the inner planets, I mean, we'd see different things. But um, they're all solid objects. They're all rocky objects. You could land, hypothetically, on each one of these objects. So, for instance, if we were to go to Mars, and we have, not people, but we've sent lots of rovers to Mars. We've got a rover on Mars right now. And it's driving around on the surface, and it is studying rocks and craters and dried up riverbeds. And you could study, you could have a whole unit on the geology of Mars. So all of the inner planets have geology, right? They have solid surfaces. Um, and Mars is just one example we could talk about. Uh, we could talk a whole lot about each one of these planets, but I just want to give you guys a quick tour. Um, but then, 
if we get beyond the inner planets, let's go back out to the scale of the solar system. You guys are helping me with the, uh, the names of them. We had, we were at Mars. All right, so what comes after Mars? Anybody know? Jupiter. Jupiter. Yeah, good. Good. Jupiter. Jupiter. And then after that, we've got Saturn. 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 And Neptune. Then we've got Uranus and Neptune. But I'm just going to leave. Neptune. What about Pluto? Yeah, Pluto. Yeah. We could talk about Pluto. Yeah, we could turn Pluto on. Pluto is a dwarf planet. Um, so we could turn Pluto's orbit on here in a minute if we want to. But what I want to show you guys about the outer planets is that they're really different than the inner planets. The outer planets are solid and rocky. The, uh, the inner planets are solid and rocky. The outer planets, though, are the gas giants. They don't have any solid surfaces. If you were to go to one like Saturn, you wouldn't be able to land on the surface of Saturn. It doesn't really have a surface. It's just a big ball of gas. So you could study the clouds of Saturn, and you could study weather on Saturn, and you could certainly study the beautiful rings of Saturn, but you couldn't study any geology on Saturn, or Jupiter, or Neptune, or Uranus. So the outer planets are very, very different from the inner planets. Okay, so, but I said I was gonna give you guys a little tour of the, uh, of the galaxy, starting with our sun as a star. So we've got our solar system here with the orbits of, not all the planets, but all the planets we can see with your naked eye. And let's turn those labels off. So our so, oops, I turned labels on. I'm gonna turn labels off. Um, so our solar system is everything that goes around our sun, the star, uh, our star, the sun. And that includes planets, it includes comets and asteroids, it includes dwarf planets like Pluto. But our sun with its planetary system, like we were just talking about, is just one star among an entire galaxy of stars. So if we were to travel outward from our star on the order of maybe a couple hundred light years, we would start to see other stars enter the picture. And I left the constellations on because look what starts happening to our constellations. Our constellations start to get stretched and distorted because what we see in the night sky is just our point of view, how the stars look like from our perspective in our solar system. If we were to move outward away from our star so that it just looked like one star among many, uh, all of the constellations would get unfamiliar. It would be hard to find the same pattern of stars in the sky. And in fact, if we kept moving outward, and let me go ahead, we don't wanna get lost, so let me turn the sun's label back on so we can keep track of where the sun is. If we continue to move outward, oh, there's Betelgeuse. What we'll notice is that our little corner of the star, of, of our sun, the star, uh, and the stars near it, is just one little corner of an entire city of stars, an entire collection of almost 200 billion stars that we call our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. So here's a point of view from our galaxy looking back toward our sun. And when we look at our sun from this point of view, we notice a couple things about the galaxy. Our galaxy is disc-like. It's shaped like a disc, it's flat. So that most stars are in the disc of the galaxy, including our own sun. The other thing that we notice is that our sun is not at the center of the galaxy. Our sun is about halfway out from the center of the galaxy to the edge of the galaxy. Here's our sun about halfway. And the final thing that we notice is that, remember these red lines? These red lines are marking constellations that we see in our sky. That means even if I turned every single constellation that we can see on, all 88 constellations, now all of these red lines are all the constellations we see in our night sky. That's just one tiny fraction of the galaxy. So all the stars that we see in our night sky are just one small portion of our entire system of stars that makes up the Milky Way galaxy. Our galaxy is huge. If you were riding on the beam of light at the speed of light, it would take you 100,000 years to get from one side of our galaxy 
to the other. And now I've gotten us basically all the way to where we started. Because if we continue on beyond our own galaxy, there are millions and billions and even trillions of other galaxies beyond ours. So every direction that we look beyond our galaxy, we see more galaxies. So you've got our solar system circling one star in our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, and then our galaxy is one galaxy in a universe of trillions and trillions of galaxies. All right. So we have gone from our own star to the edge of the universe itself. And I will pull this back up so I can, I, I've, I've hit everybody. I can't see anyone. Let me see if I can. Okay, here we go. Now I can see people again. All right. So let me pause there um, and turn it over to your teachers for a second. To see if there's anything that I missed in our little tour, quick tour of the night sky and the galaxy. And then uh, if there's anything else that we want to talk about. Mr. Gardner, are you still there? I'm still there. Um, All right. Yeah, I, that, was, uh, that was awesome. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, Thanks for coming. I know the kids have got loads of questions. I don't know if there's anything in particular that we want to see. Um, Mr. Berger, did you think of anything that you wanted to check out? Um, no, the only other question that kind of came to my mind was like the age of the stars, you were talking about younger and older, what, how many billions of years are we talking? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, um, so the, some of the youngest stars that we can see in the sky are the newborn stars in Orion, the Orion Nebula. Those are just a couple million years old. Most stars are on the order of billions of years old. As best we can tell, our sun, a middle-aged star, has been around for about five billion years and should last for another about five billion years. Um, the other thing that's kind of backward about stars is that the bigger the star, the faster it burns its fuel and so the shorter it lives. So a really big star like Betelgeuse, even though uh, it's old, it's near the end of its life, it probably didn't have a very long lifespan. It might've just been a couple hundred million years or a billion years, where a smaller star like the sun can last for several billion years. Good question. I see hands, yeah. but I'm not sure exactly how you guys wanna handle, um, <laughs> but uh, Rob, how I do you wanna handle this? I think the way that we wanted to do it was um, the kids should know how to use their hand up feature and we're going to uh, get them to put their hands up if they've got a question. I know some of them have been like thinking of questions that they wanted to ask. So uh, if we go hands up uh, using the hands up feature, uh, for any of those of you that don't know how to do this, um, there's a little uh, tab at the bottom. Um, where there's a couple of people and it's called participants. If you click on that, there should be a little uh, feature that says raise your hand. So if you've got a question that you want to ask, um, raise your hand and then we'll choose uh, someone to ask a question. Yeah, and Mr. Gardner, I'm gonna let you choose because you know the students and-, and I'll let you <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Uh, okay, well, uh, I got Brandon up here first, so uh, Brandon, I'm going to unmute you and you can ask your question, okay? How do you measure gravity? Ooh, that's a really good question. So I think, Brandon, correct me, you said how do you measure gravity? Yeah. Okay. Um, so let me see if there's a, if there's a way that I can show us pretty easily. Um, so the easiest way to measure gravity in space is if you have any object that's orbiting around any other object. So I'm going to put us in orbit of the earth right now. Um, we know that, uh, we've got things orbiting the earth, right? We've got, um, the moon orbits the earth. Uh, I'm going to put us in an Earth orbit. And in fact, I'm going to show you some of the other things that orbit around the Earth. So um, 
probably maybe some of you guys, or at least your parents have, uh, have cell phones. Maybe some of you guys have satellite television. Uh, one of the things that we do uh, right here is we launch into orbit satellites. So all these green dots are satellites that we have orbiting the Earth. And in fact, if I change time, and uh, we can actually look at how they're moving. They're all falling around the Earth, which is basically what an orbit is. It's a path of falling around the Earth. Um, and the best way, the easiest way for us as astronomers to orbit gravity, uh, to, to rather to measure gravity, is you just have to have one object that's orbiting around another object. And then if you measure how fast that object is moving, how long it takes to go around once, you can measure the mass of the orbiting object. So this works for anything. This is how we can measure the mass of the Earth or the, the force of gravity of the Earth. We can measure the gravity of the sun by how long it takes the sun to go around the Earth, um, uh, this, uh, rather the Earth to go around the sun. Um, we could measure the mass of a black hole by how long it takes a star to go around that black hole. So astronomers, that's how we measure gravity. We measure stuff orbiting around other stuff. Good question. Okay, uh, let's go to uh, Luke Simmons. What happens when a star dies? All right, good question too. So Luke's question was what happens when a star dies? So we are looking at, I showed you in the sky, a couple constellations. And I want to take you back to one of them because we can actually see where a star has died in that constellation. Um, so I'll get rid of all these satellites. And remember I showed you this constellation called Lyra. Um, let's turn Lyra on. And the short answer of what happens when a star dies is, oops, get rid of the atmosphere again. If you can find the constellation Lyra, in the constellation Lyra, there's what we call a supernova remnant, which is basically what's left when a star dies. When a star uses up all its fuel, it goes supernova, um, depending on how big it is. Some stars don't do this quite as explosively. Um, but it basically, it, its core collapses, and there's all these different processes, but then it sort of expels its outer atmosphere, it barfs its outer atmosphere back into space. And um, that stuff then can be re reused to make other stars. But what I want to do is I want to show you a picture of the ring nebula. I think I can fly us there if I am careful and pick the right one. So I'm trying to take us to uh, NGC 6720, which is a ring nebula, I think it's the ring nebula, but maybe not. Yeah, it is. So our spaceship is lifting off from the Earth again, and we're going to head and take a look at what happens when a star goes supernova. So actually, Betelgeuse, the star I showed you guys earlier, is pretty old. It's pretty close to going supernova. Astronomers have no idea, they can't tell exactly when it's going to go supernova, but they know at some point, maybe a thousand years from now, maybe tomorrow, um, it's going to go nova. And in fact, last year, it started dimming. The Betelgeuse started getting dim in a really weird way. And a lot of astronomers thought it was on its way to going supernova. Uh, since then, it stopped dimming, so we don't think we're quite there yet. But here's a picture of the Ring Nebula. The Ring Nebula is in the constellation Lyra. And from the Earth, it looks like a big ring because we see sort of the outer shell of gas that's been expelled by the star when the star dies. So at the center of the ring nebula, there is still the tiny core, the leftover core of the star. We call that a white dwarf. But the outer atmosphere of the star is what we see as the nebula. Good question. I have really good questions. Uh, let's go to Amina. How does a black form, a uh, black hole form? 
Yeah, I don't think I can show you that one very easily. Um, but the simplest answer is, if you have a star that's big enough, right? So here's our sun. You need to think about every star as tug of war. Every star is playing tug of war. You've got gravity that wants to crunch it in, and then you've got the energy that the star is giving off in its core, the energy that's making it glow and giving it heat, that energy pushing out. So as long as those things are balanced, the star is healthy. When it runs out of fuel, gravity starts to win that tug of war and it starts to collapse. Now, if a star is big enough, it's gotta be a huge star like Rigel, not like our sun, our sun will never do this. Uh, but if you've got a huge star, when it runs out of fuel, there's nothing to stop its gravitational collapse and it collapses all the way down into an infinitely small, infinitely dense point that we call a black hole. And the thing that makes it black is if you get close enough, the gravity from a black hole is so great, nothing can escape it, not even light itself. So we can't see black holes directly, we can only see things as, um, as things are falling in toward the black hole. Um, so I'll show you where to find one black hole in the sky. I can't really show you a great picture of a black hole, but I'll show you where to find a black hole. And unfortunately, you can't find it in the winter sky. You've got to wait until summer. So if we go to, hmm, let's say, a summer night in July and get the sun to set, and we look way down here in the southern sky, at the very bottom of your screen, We've got this um, constellation that looks kind of like a teapot. It's kind of hard to see, but here's the, here's the spout of the teapot. Here's the lid, here's the handle, uh, here's the bottom of the teapot. Someone was saying that uh, the Big Dipper was Scorpius. Here's the actual Scorpius down here in the Southern sky. Um, but if you can find this teapot in the summer sky, it kind of looks like the Milky Way is steam rising out of the teapot. You look toward that teapot, you're looking toward the center of our galaxy. And we know there's a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. So you can point to that spot in the sky, in the southern summer sky, and say, hey, there's a black hole over there at the center of our galaxy. And one of the reasons we know it's a black hole is because we can calculate its mass, like I was saying earlier with the, the first question about gravity. Good questions. Uh, let's go to Jaden. the weirdest thing that you've seen? <laughs> uh, the weirdest thing that I have ever seen in the sky. That's a really good question. Um, one of the coolest things I've ever seen was the Northern Lights. I saw those here from Illinois way back when I was a student. They don't, they don't usually come this far south, but we had a really active solar cycle and I was able to see uh, the Northern Lights. Another really cool thing that I've seen, we didn't get a chance to talk about the moon. In fact, if we go to tonight, I'm not even sure where the moon is in the sky right now. I haven't been paying attention to where the moon is or what phase it's in. Let's see if we can find the moon. Because um, one of the coolest things that I've ever seen involved the moon and the sun. And maybe some of you guys saw it as well. Oh, there's the moon. So the moon is a tiny crescent moon. Um, just before the sun comes up in the morning sky. So if you get up before dawn, you can see a crescent moon. You're probably also going to see a couple of planets. Uh, I think Venus and Mercury are visible. Yep, there's Venus and you could catch, you could basically catch all of the visible planets if you're up late enough. Um, but a couple summers ago, the moon moved right in front of the sun. We call that a total solar eclipse. So from Southern Illinois, the moon completely blocked the sun in the middle of the day. So for a couple minutes, it got completely dark and the stars came out. And that was by far the coolest thing and probably the weirdest thing that I've ever seen in the sky. Maybe some of you guys saw it. Maybe some of you guys remember that. It's happening again soon. There'll be another uh, total solar eclipse visible from Illinois uh, in 2024, I think. So just a couple years. Uh, let's go to uh, Kali Wagner. Hey, Kali, are you there? Uh, 
Oh, I can't hear Callie. I'm sorry. I can see that she unmuted herself, but I can't hear what she's saying. All right, we'll move on and we'll see if we can get Callie up um, working in a little bit. Maybe she Sorry, can. Sorry, Callie. Uh, maybe, so, uh, maybe one of her teachers can share uh, her question. Uh, let's go to Angel really quick. Um, how did you get to be in the planetarium? So say that again, how big does, how big is the planetarium? No, how did you uh, get your job in the planetarium? Oh, how did I get my job? Yeah, thank you. Um, so that's a good question too. So like I said, when I came to college, I wanted to go to school where there was a planetarium so I could learn how to run a planetarium. Um, so there are lots of different colleges that have planetariums, not a whole lot. Um, uh, all of that's one in our area that does. Um, Carthage University up in Wisconsin, I think, has a planetarium as well. Um, and I studied astronomy. So my major was physical science. And then I knew I wanted to work at a university. So I knew I needed to go to graduate school. So I did my graduate degree at the University of Mississippi. I did a master's in physics. Um, and uh, then I did my PhD at the University of Notre Dame. Um, and uh, then I was looking for teaching positions and uh, luckily was able to find one here at my alma mater back at all of that teaching. So uh, a lot of study, uh, a lot of school. My kids make fun of me. They say my, my children, uh, we've got four kids. They say I was in school for most of my life from kindergarten all the way on through getting a PhD. Um, and, uh, and then doing a lot of uh, math, math and writing. Math and writing are the two really important things for scientists because you have to be able to understand the equations that can explain physical principles, and then you have to be able to communicate that clearly. So you have to be able to write really well as well. So, um, so yeah, so that's sort of how I, I ended up here in this position. Um, some of you guys were asking, uh, I think we've got time for a couple more questions, but some of you guys were asking about um, Pluto. So I wanted to talk a little bit about Pluto and show you uh, where Pluto would be on our, um, on our solar system uh, model. So if I move us to the sun and I turn the orbits of the planets on, I can turn the orbit of Pluto on as well. It'll just take me a moment to find it. Cool. All right, so you guys helped me with all of the, all of the planets in the solar system. Um, and we stopped with the orbits of Jupiter and Saturn, but now I've turned on the orbits of um, Uranus and Neptune as well. And I'm gonna show you guys what's going on with Pluto. All right, oh. so if we move back out so we can look at the solar system as a whole, we, now we've got all the planets on our solar system model. And I'll turn the labels off. Um, and that outermost ring is the orbit of Neptune. So now I'll go ahead and I'll turn Pluto's orbit on. So you can see what's different about Pluto. So let's turn on Pluto's orbit. So here's the orbit of Pluto, the green line. Now, Pluto was discovered in 1930. And we always knew Pluto was a little bit odd. We knew it was the smallest planet. And we also saw that its orbit was tilted with respect to all the other planets. So you can see all the other planets are in this nice flat plane of the solar system. And Pluto's kind of off here doing its own thing um, at an angle. So it's kind of got a tilted orbit. But we didn't think there was anything really wrong with that or anything odd about that until we started discovering other Pluto-like objects out there. So in the 1990s, we discovered an object called Eris about the same size as Pluto, but orbits even farther away from the sun in an even crazier orbit. So this other green line is the orbit of Eris. And as our telescopes have gotten better and better, we found more and more of these 
we call them trans-Neptunian objects, objects beyond the orbit of Neptune. We're going to turn on the orbit of Sedna and Huamea and Makimaki. And these are all objects like Pluto that orbit out here at the edge of the solar system with Pluto. So astronomers said, well, hey, wait, are these all just planets? Do we need to keep adding planets to the solar system? Or do we need a different definition of what it means to be a planet? So uh, astronomers got together and they said, okay, a planet is going to be a big object that's round, that orbits the sun, and that is the biggest thing in its area of the solar system. Pluto is clearly not. Pluto orbits around with a bunch of other junk. So we're going to consider Pluto and all these other big objects that orbit in this area called the Kuiper Belt, which is this sort of field of icy debris at the edge of the solar system. We're going to call these dwarf planets. So Pluto is still there, but we're going to consider it a dwarf planet instead of a planet. So instead of our solar system losing a planet, we've gained a dwarf planet along with several of these other objects, Huamea, Makimaki, Eris, and Sedna. So it turns out our solar system is even more complicated. And I tell people this is really exciting because it means we're st there's still a lot to learn about our own planetary backyard. So sorry, that was just a question that came up earlier. I wanted to make sure we had a chance to take a look at Pluto. Steve, how many more questions do you think we have time for? Uh, I don't know. You're the one. Um, I, I mean, I don't care. I'm good. Uh, I don't know what your schedule looks like, though. I don't want to keep you guys into your next lesson or whatever you need to be doing. Well, I think maybe we should just have like a, a couple more and then, uh, and then we'll be done. That sounds great. Yeah. All right. So let's, uh, let's choose Sophia Simmons. How big can a star get? So I think the question was, how big can a star get, right? Okay. So that's a really good question, and that's actually something astronomers are still trying to figure out. Um, some of the largest stars that we know of are much, much, much bigger than our sun. Um, I can't show you this easily on the screen, but there are some stars that are maybe even as much as 100 times bigger than our sun. But that seems to be the extreme. Um, and then there are also stars that are much, much smaller than our sun um, that maybe are about a tenth the size of our sun. So astronomers aren't really sure exactly how big a star can get, but they can get pretty large. Celia, uh, would you like to ask your question? Um, how big is the sun? Oh, that's a really good question. How big is the sun? Um, mm, I can show you this easily. So, there, uh, I have a demonstration, but I, I'm not sure I can find it quickly enough for you guys, that shows the scale size of the sun next to the planets. So it's kind of hard to see in our model of the solar system because the planets are just like tiny little dots. Um, but basically, I build a model with my students sometimes that if the sun were in orange, um, the Earth would be like a speck of dust. So that kind of gives you a sense of the size. But on that scale, the edge of the solar system would be like all the way across campus. Um, so the sun is about a million times in terms of volume the size of the Earth quite, quite large. But if you want to think of something in your head, think of something the size of an orange being the sun and the earth would be about the size of a tiny, tiny speck of dust. All right. Uh, Helen, do you want to ask your question? What is a dwarf planet? Yeah, so that's a good question too. So I use this term, a dwarf planet. Um, really, a dwarf planet is just another, it's just a way of classifying things in our solar system. So anything that orbits the sun and is big enough to be round, so it has enough gravity to shape itself into a circle, is considered a planet. If you have something that is like a planet, 
but even smaller, we would consider that a dwarf planet. And then if you have something that is even smaller than that, you're maybe talking about something like a comet or an asteroid, just a little, just a little fragment of space debris or space, um, space dust. Um, and then if you have something that orbits a planet, you have a moon. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. Um, that's, uh, yeah, so that's probably good. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I really appreciate the chance to, um, to get to welcome you to the planetarium, at least virtually, and show you some of the things that our planetarium system can do. Hopefully, when this is all over and school get back, gets back to normal, you guys can come visit the planetarium for real and actually see all of this on a giant dome over your head instead of just on your, uh, on your computer screens. But thank you for the question. Those are excellent questions, and I hope you guys are enjoying um, your units uh, in school, learning about stars and the sun and, uh, and outer space. Yeah, thank you, Steve, for uh, taking some time out of your day to show us uh, all the different things in the galaxy. We uh, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, no worries. Hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Steve. Bye. 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 Bye.